started here tonight. Um, we need Psalm 16, the last five verses. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are ple <clears throat> pleasures forevermore. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we come unto thee in prayer tonight, asking thy blessing upon this speech. We are thankful that Reverend and Mrs. Erics were able to come here tonight and give instruction on the parenting of our teens. We pray that we may receive this good instruction and put it into practice. Please bless this school as we strive to train up our children according to thy will. We ask that thou would forgive our sins and keep us from sin this hour. In Jesus' name we pray these things alone. Amen. All right, I have the pleasure of being able to introduce uh, Reverend Eric and his wife from Unity PRC. Present a speech on raising up our teenagers. And I'm told there will be a time of questions and answers afterwards. And also, uh, if anyone, we know of anyone who was wanting to come that couldn't, we are recording this and it will be posted on uh, Trinity's website, I believe, how to get to the YouTube page uh, in the next day or so. So, with that, I'll turn it over to Reverend Aries. Is coming yet? Well, we are a little early. So. I didn't know Iowa time at seven thirty. You know, seven thirty means seven twenty-five. So <laughs> it doesn't work. Like that. Well, we can wait a couple of minutes if if you think others are coming yet. So yeah, we got to uh, double dip on this trip. Uh, we did schedule it purposely because their daughter was due with a, a baby last week and uh, the baby was born a little early, so that worked out well. They're afraid he's gonna be born late and we didn't want to miss that. So we were able to see our granddaughter uh, Morning, Stephen and Julia, so. so. Oh, she just gets shorter. Okay, so we're glad to be here tonight and uh, thankful for the opportunity to present some things on parenting to you tonight, but Jen's going to get the opportunity to begin, and then she gets the last word while she's here as well. So. <laughs> I just appreciate, appreciate the introduction when you said we were going to get good instruction. That's what I mean. That's optimistic. I like that. Um, it's good to be back in Paul. It makes me, um, yeah, it's a great trip, of course, because we got to see our granddaughter, but also to come back home again and share it, it makes me feel a little old because I think I might see a few that um, I babysat over here in the crowd, and so that makes me feel a little bit old, but we are parents of teenagers. We've been parenting since 1996. God has given us six children by birth. They're ages 14 to 26. Uh, five girls and one boy. We have three sons by marriage that we also love and adore, but more to the point of tonight's speech, we've been parenting teenagers since 2009. We've had at least two teenagers, sometimes as many as four in our house at a time. Currently, we have three. We've seen our share of eye rolls and sullen looks and drama. Um, we've heard, since we have mostly girls, we hear a lot of, I have nothing to wear, or I don't even know why I'm crying. But we've also never laughed so hard as when all of those teenage, teenagers were home. So, but I would say that probably we never prayed more than at that point either. We um, still say that we've enjoyed our teenagers, and even though we haven't parented them perfectly, parenting
connecting with teens is not for the faint of heart, but it can be enjoyable. And we're thankful for the opportunity to come and encourage you tonight. Just know that even though we are physically in front of you, we stand beside you encouraging teenagers because it is a high calling and, and we like to think we're doing that all together. And so we, we don't come here as experts who know everything about uh, parenting or parenting teenagers especially. Um, my being a pastor doesn't make me any more of an expert uh, in it. It's a struggle for us just so like it is uh, in any home. Uh, as Jen said, we learned to depend upon God uh, as we did this and we're still learning that as well. So we come here tonight simply to encourage you in the calling that God has given to us and the, God, and the calling that God has given uh, to you as well. If you come here hoping that there is some sort of six-step or 12-step program and so that if you just do this, 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 then you can check off the list and then out will come this pliable, obedient uh, teenager and then older child as well, well, you will be extremely disappointed. God in his word has not given a 12-step program or a six-step program. He's not given the exact way uh, to do it so that you can have the desired end. He does tell us the way that we're to do it, but all we're called to do is be faithful and then we trust God with the uh, hearts of our children as well. So we want to focus on that. Our, our theme tonight and our focus tonight is this, and you already saw that when um, it was advertised and you see it on the sheet in front of you as well. Lose the attitude. Lose the attitude. When we think about attitude and teenage whose attitude do we think about? We think about the attitude sometimes of our teenagers. Uh, maybe you have a son or a daughter, or you had a son or a daughter who was sullen and angry and disrespectful, and their attitude has not been great, and you've struggled with that. But we're not here to talk about the attitude so much of those teenagers um, when we say lose the attitude, we're speaking to you and to us as parents. Because what can happen in our parenting is we have a bad attitude. And so we need to lose the attitude if we want our young people to lose the bad attitude that they may have uh, as well. So we need to examine ourselves and look at the negative attitudes uh, that we might have. And that begins with a thinking that uh, maybe you remember that as you were looking up at teen, uh, parenting teenagers, you were thinking, this might be the worst stage of parenting. Uh, we might dread it. Uh, we might make sarcastic comments about it to our kids and to others as well. And then that reminds us that our attitude might not be right when it comes to So you've probably heard the phrase, bigger kids means bigger problems. And I don't know if you've noticed, I just read, uh, I, I noticed this personally, but I read it this week, that adding teenage as an adjective before almost anything <coughs> makes that anything seem negative. If you have a driver, that's one thing, but if you have a teenage driver, now you talk, oh, they just sigh and roll their eyes, even adults do that. Or what about a teenage bonfire? A bonfire is one thing, but what if you have a teenage bonfire? Now, now are you kind of thinking, or hormones, teenage hormones, that's a whole other thing, right? So if you've noticed that, it almost makes it, the teenagers seem a little scary, like do we live in fear of our teenagers? And do we really think that because they're bigger kids they have bigger problems? If we think those things, that can keep us from loving and serving and instructing these children of the king the way that we're called to. So, one of the things that we always seem to understand is if we have this attitude of the teenage years, that's a bad attitude, that's going to lead to a wrong way in which we're dealing with them. And so what can develop over time in that uh, age period is that the relationship becomes combative, uh, confrontation, confrontational, or adversarial. I think that's one of the dangers of the teenage years is the relationship, especially between between parents and those children becomes that. It's one of the reasons that um, 
although I hear it often, I refuse to use the phrase, um, I'm going to pick my battles. So maybe you as parents have used that phrase. I'm, I'm not telling you don't use it at all, but I refuse to use that phrase. I understand the meaning of it and that the idea is, is we're not going to uh, major on minors. We're not going to focus on everything so that we're constantly uh, harping on it. But at the same time, I think that phrase expresses and conveys a certain relationship that we might have with our teenagers. And we might look at them in an adversarial way when we're talking about picking our battles. We're looking at life with them as a constant battle of the wills. And sometimes there is that. I understand that. But that's not what we want our relationship uh, with our kids to be. If we view them that way, about what that's, how that's going to be carried out in life. Uh, we might be sarcastic with them. We might be snarky with them. We might be argumentative with them. We might be condescending to them. And we begin to view them as getting in the way of our own ease and getting in the way of the things that we want to do and the way we want things to go in our home. So this adversarial relationship uh, develops. That can happen when they become a Philadelphia lawyer, okay? So we've noticed that with a couple of our kids, especially when they get to the teenage years, they turn into a lawyer. They will argue about anything. And it's easy to get sucked into that, and then it's arguing back and forth, and it goes nowhere, of course, because the moment you do that, it's an adversarial relationship. It's kind of where they want you to be, and that's not the kind of relationship that we want. I came across this quote from Richard Phillips, a book he wrote called The Masculine Mandate. Uh, it's especially for men. Uh, well, it is a book for men. But he says this about parenting. He says, I will always be in my children's side, even if I am punishing them. I will never be against them. I will never speak to them with contempt. I think that ought to be a rule for us in our parenting. I will never speak down to them. Never speak with contempt, never in a condescending way. I'm always for you. It's very important to communicate that with our kids. There was a time when one of our kids was coming into this stage, and um, this is one of the good or bad things you could say about having a husband study. A husband study in the house. He was just on the other side of the wall, and he heard a communication back and forth from myself and this child. We were setting the table. I still to this day have no idea what we were arguing about, but she sucked me in and, and it was back and forth. And later that night, um, my husband mentioned to me that I wanted, I should be careful about that because I don't want our relationship to be characterized by that kind of argument. And it was not the easiest thing to hear, but it was good. And I'm glad that it happened early in our parenting of teenagers so that I could be aware of that because even since that, it is easy to get sucked in because I'm the mom I'm supposed to be right, and so I'm gonna just argue you back into the ground, and of course, if you're both doing that, there's no profit. Um, one thing I think is another common attitude, a bad attitude for parents is, they're just gonna, I'm just gonna have to wait till they go out of it. I'm gonna head for the bunker when they turn 13, and when they turn 20, we'll come out and we'll just live in dread that those years that are teenage years, and we're gonna gut it out, and Hopefully when they're 20, they'll emerge as a decent human being. And we can't leave them to their, themselves at that age. They need us even though they think that they don't. And so it's not a time to just hunker down and um, be absent from their lives. Uh, here's a quote that I found that I really appreciated. Shanti Feldhan says, what we expect to see is what we look for. And what we look for is what we will find. If we expect difficulties, such as terrible twos, teenagers, difficult tweens, disrespectful and needy teenagers, that's what we will notice and probably overreact to. I would urge you to look forward to every season of parenting so that you enjoy the blessings of each one rather than getting hung up on the challenges. So that's the bad attitude we don't want to have. We but we need to talk about the good and the positive attitude that we ought to have towards parenting our teens. 
Uh, Paul Tripp, uh, maybe you've writ read some things by him. He's written a book on parenting teenagers, and the title of that book is Age of Opportunity. And as Jen mentioned in the quote that she read, parenting teenagers, we have to look at that as a wonderful season of parenting, because really it is. It doesn't mean it's easy all the time, but it is a wonderful season of parenting. If we can encourage you in anything, it would be that. Embrace this wonderful season of parenting. It is a wonderful season of parenting because, well, we're going to talk about that in a moment too, but our children are growing and they're developing, and, and we can see that in them. There's conversations that we can have with them that you can't have when they're younger, and we're seeing the work of God in them as they grow and develop. And so it's a wonderful season of parenting. And it's a wonderful season for us in our parenting as well. It's an opportunity for us to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ to these young people in our home. It's a time for us to be servants of Jesus Christ in our parenting. I had the opportunity to lead chapel uh, here at school today, and one of the passages that I read just very briefly uh, with uh, the students here was out of Matthew 20. Uh, it's a passage in which uh, James and John and their mother came to Jesus asking to sit on the right hand and the left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. And the Ten other disciples heard about the two disciples and their mom doing that, and we read there, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. So in our language today, we would say the ten were ticked at the two because of what they had done. And this created a great division among them, but it was a teaching opportunity for Jesus. And he says in that next verse, well, those who are in the world, they want dominion, they want rule, they want people under them, but he says, it's not so in my kingdom. He goes on to say this, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Minister, the Greek word is uh, the, the word we have for deacon, it's diakonos, and it means servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. This period of parenting is an opportunity for us to grow in being servants to uh, the young people in our homes. This is brought home to me in another book that I've read recently on humility. I think I expressed this to the young people today uh, in chapel also. It's a book on humility. And one of the things that he relates in that book is a time when he was late for a meeting. He had to do some parenting of his teenage son, and he just spoke to him very briefly and shortly on what he had done, and then he had to leave for that meeting. And then his wife said to him later on, and my wife does correct me as well, we help each other out. We need to help each other out, a little aside there. But this wife said to her husband, um, I didn't see you um, speaking the gospel to our son in the parenting today. And what that emphasized to me is the great importance of our demonstrating, our showing the gospel. What does that mean? Well, the grace and the love and the mercy of God in our parenting. Just think about that. In a moment that wasn't going well with the young person you were parenting, did that young person, did your son, see the gospel, see the grace and the mercy of God. I mean, that pierces my heart to think about all the times I parented and our children did not see the grace and the mercy and the love of God in me. So that's the attitude that we want to have. So what would that look like in real life? How would our teenagers know that we have lost the attitude? Well, first of all, it does not mean I have a good attitude toward you and you can do whatever you want does not mean that. Instead, we want to show that grace and compassion and patience to our teens. We want to be willing to give of ourselves and to be inconvenienced for them. Um, sometimes in our house, that means we stay up later than we normally would because 
at about 11 o'clock, that's when the mouths open. And so we want to be there for that. And so even though we'd much rather be in bed, we stay up or at least wake up for that conversation at that time of night. So one thing we need to talk about is who is this kid that I'm called to love and serve and be inconvenienced for and have a positive attitude about? This is an age of transition from childhood to adulthood, both physically and spiritually. So here's, some, here's three things that you should know about your teenager. Uh, first of all, we are to view them as children of God. We're to view them according to what we've learned about the truth of the covenant and the way God works in the line of generations. Again, we know that. It's built into our thinking. Yet, easily, that goes out the window in a moment uh, of difficulty with that child. So it's important for us to remember these children are saints, that they are loved by Christ, saved with his precious blood, and we are to see them as children of God unless they show otherwise. And that's what we're doing then. We're teaching them to live as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. So that, first of all, saints, children of God, that's how we're to them. We also need to understand that physically there are changes taking place in those bodies as they change from adults to children. They are somewhat brain deficient. I did not say brain damaged. Don't hear that. Brain deficient. The frontal lobe of their brain is not even fully developed, and that's true of all of us until we're 24 years old. What does that part of the brain control? Empathy, impulse control, the ability to judge consequences. Anybody who has a teenager recognizes all of those things, right? But it's not an excuse for sin. We don't want to excuse their sin. It's really okay that you did that. I realize that you're very deficient. That's not exactly how that works. But we just want to be able to know that they are going to struggle with that. And that means we can walk through them with those things because they're tasting freedom of adulthood but they don't have complete brain wiring. So we want to just help them with that. There's also changing hormones. Teenagers can be emotional and moody, can change like the wind from laughing to crying within seconds. It's, it's impressive. <laughs> um, but even the changing hormones is not an excuse for sinful behavior. Emotions were created by God and they're good and they're beautiful. But um, one place that I read compared them to spirited wild horses. They're beautiful, and they're made by God, but they have to be under control. So you as the rider, child, have to be in control of your emotions. You can't claim that they're wrong or sinful, but we don't want to let the emotions drive the bus either. So that's an important physical thing to rem remember about our teenagers. The third thing we remember about our teenagers is that they have sinful natures just like we do. They're struggling with the same thing that we do. And this is why it is we should not view our children as the enemy. They're not the enemy. The sin in them and the sin in us, that is the enemy. But our young people are struggling with that same sinful, self-centered nature. And they are selfish, just like we all are. They want their own privacy. They think they're entitled to it. They think they're entitled to a, a phone. They think they're entitled to a car. They think they're entitled to freedom. And they want all of these things, not only want them, but they think that they need them and they ought to have these things. And there's so many other examples of that, but the point is this. Your young people, your teenagers are going to sin. And they're going to do some things in which you're gonna to wanna to say to them, what were you thinking? How could you do something like that? You ever find yourself saying that? I've had to catch myself and realize, and, and I would say this, don't say that. Don't say it. Why? Because it's not consistent with your theology. Your theology is you believe total depravity. You believe total depravity. I believe total depravity. That means whatever these children are going to do, I'm not going to be surprised that because I know they have a sinful nature. I know it by experience of my own sinful nature and the things that I've done, not just presently, but even in the past. And so we understand that they are struggling with sin. So remember, your young person in the home is not the enemy. It's sin with 
in them is the enemy. Now there's maybe one other thing that we can put with that. So I started and said, this is how we view our young people, they're saints, children of God. Secondly, they're struggling with sin. There's another element of that, and we, we noticed that as we were going over the speech in preparation for the night. They're also suffering. They're dealing with hard things, like we all are dealing with hard things. We can't forget that about them. There is that danger that we only view them according to a sin struggle. But there are sufferings for our young people, and some of them have great suffering uh, in their lives. So they're saints who are sinners and they, they are sufferers. Now, that leads into uh, the next point that we have. So not only are we looking at who is this kid, but we're taking a big look, uh, a big picture look at parenting. What are the goals that we have? So goals of parenting are not, we're gonna start there. Our goal for our teenagers is not earthly success. A college scholarship is nice, but that's not our ultimate goal for our kids. A good job, that's great, but it's not our ultimate goal. Our goal for them is not just a better life than I have, a bigger house, maybe one on the lake that I can visit, maybe one that, maybe a nice job where you can retire by 55. That's not the kind of goal that we have for our teenagers. Our goal for them is also not popularity and to be liked by everyone at school. So those are things, some things that are not goals for parents and teenagers. But the goal that we have for them is that they would be followers of Jesus Christ that they would be disciples of Jesus Christ. Remember what a disciple is as defined by Jesus, one who denies himself, takes up his cross, and follows Jesus in all things. That includes many different things. That means what we want them to be is worshipers of the one true and living God. We, we want them to be conformed to the image of his son. I taught, that was the main thing that I talked to the students about today in chapel. I used Romans 8, 28 and 29. And 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, we want our young people to be conformed to the image of his son, to be like Jesus Christ, to be a reflection of Jesus Christ in the lives that they live. And, and I talk to them about specific ways, specific in instances in which that is to be lived out. This isn't something just abstract. It's in the small moments of life sometimes. So, for example, I talk to them about a sporting event, <clears throat> a game that they're involved in. Maybe it's a soccer game or a volleyball match or a basketball game when that comes around and they're uh, playing basketball here in the gym. And then maybe the ref makes a bad call at the end of the game that seems to change the outcome of that game. So we all know the emotions that arise when we're sitting in the stands or we're a player on the court or on the field and then we get upset uh, about that and then I had them think about this. What does it mean to reflect Jesus Christ in that moment? For us many times and for them, being a disciple of Jesus Christ and a follower of Jesus Christ goes out the window in that moment. So that's one example. When our kids are mistreated, either by a classmate or maybe they feel mistreated by a teacher who put a question on the test that they are positive they never heard in the lecture. And so they feel mistreated by that. And we want our kids to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so we want them to have Christ-like humility in that situation. And it's a hard thing to say. We want to say, I'm sorry that you're going through that. But how can God be using this in your life to make you more like Jesus Christ? In humility or just patience and suffering? Sometimes we have kids who are perfectionists. They want to have that 4.0 or higher, and they're willing to do whatever it is to get that. But when we're, we're living that out in real life, and we want that child to be a disciple of Christ and be conformed to the image of his son and to worship God alone, Really, perfectionism, is, in a way, is worshiping your own self and putting your own desire for a good grade above everything else. Instead of worshiping the true God and serving him, we're serving ourselves by the amount of time we're putting into our work because it's so important for us to have a perfect grade. And maybe with that teacher who mistreated you or 
seems like they did. You, ha you have the opportunity to be in patience with other people and God's in the family of God, and that's a beautiful thing too. Even though it's a very hard lesson to learn, I don't want to make it sound like it's an easy thing to do, but it's definitely all of those are opportunities to grow in Christ likeness. And so you see in those small moments how easy it is, um, even as parents, to get worked up, you know, against teachers, and then that filters down to our kids as well. And we don't want that. That's not being Christ like. So that's some of the big picture things. Now we do want to get a bit more practical. Uh, we've tried to sprinkle some of that in along the way, but we do want to get a bit more practical about um, how we parent teens at this time uh, and this season of their lives. Um, so that brings us to the next point. What do we do? Um, Proverbs 22, verse 6. Uh, important passage uh, that speaks to us of the instruction we give to our children. So train up a child in the way that he should, in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is an age of opportunity to teach our teenagers the way in which they are to go. To do that, we have to take the time to teach them. And so that's the first thing that I'd like to emphasize is taking the to communicate uh, with your teenager. And part of that is taking the time to get to know him or her. What makes him tick? What makes her tick? What's important to him? What's important to her? Understanding some of those things, and that takes some time. Now, some kids, yeah, they'll, they tell you everything. And some kids, it's, it's pulling, it's drawing, working really hard just to get a little bit out of them. And you can have both kinds of kids in your uh, home. But still, we need to take that time. So that means, like Jen said, we're, we're willing to stay up late some nights. We're, we're trying to suppress the yawns, and we're trying to show interest and keep our eyes open. Uh, we had it just the other night. Our son came home, and he wanted to talk, and we were both in bed, and we were both out cold, and we're trying to wake up. And he did. We had to wake up, and he, had some, he did have something important uh, to talk to us about. So we take those opportunities to do it. We take the opportunities in the car ride to talk to them. Um, this is more of a farm in the community, so maybe there are some of you working with sons or daughters on a family farm, or uh, others around here have that. And we want to take that time uh, to talk with them. But don't let them hold themselves up in their rooms. That's the age in which we live. The, the bedroom is the sanctuary. And we've uh, really worked hard to uh, dissuade our kids from spending all their time in their bedrooms. You need to do homework, come on down. Um, I know you need quiet, and right now there's little kids around, so usually it is. Um, so we want them to spend time where everybody else uh, is. Uh, I would encourage you to set limitations on how much they're out. Um, we normally don't let our kids go out during the week. If they're going to go out with friends, they do so on the weekend. During the week, they're home so that they're there for family worship regularly, uh, so that they're there uh, for communication and time spent together. And I realize it doesn't always work. There are sporting events and there are work schedules. Uh, there are some of those things going on as well. But that means setting limits as well in the phone usage. Um, I didn't say it to the young people today, but who have teenagers that you don't, they're not allowed to take their phones wherever they go. We don't let our kids take their phones into the bedrooms. Um, they have to be out in, in the open area. They go in the basket um, at night because they're, they consume their time. They spend more time on their screens. We want to have face-to-face -face conversations uh, with our kids. And, and with that, maybe we as parents have to look at ourselves too. How much time are we spending on these devices? How much time are we on our phones? Um, are we setting them aside when everybody's uh, at home? So we're taking that time and we're being purposeful and making sure there's the opportunity to communicate uh, with our kids because we want our homes to be a haven for them, a place where they want to be. Proverbs 15 verse 17 uh, speaks of that. 
It says there, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. So uh, the point being made in that verse is we don't care about the abundance of food and the fancy food on the table, even if there's just a little bit to eat. If there's love in that home, that's better than steak, uh, filet, where there's hatred. So we want our homes to be a haven for our children want to be. Part of getting to know our kids is knowing the answers to these questions. What are you afraid of? Now, some of you are probably thinking, boy, if I walked up to my teenager and asked that, they would just say nothing and walk the other way, right? So maybe you're not going to ask that question straight out. Maybe this kind of, the answer to that kind of question will come out when we discuss their struggles with them. But what we want to know when we ask these questions is we think about Proverbs 20, verse 5, where um, the wise proverb is, should I try to quote it? The heart of a man is deep waters. So far, so good. Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So we want to draw out that question, what are you afraid of? Maybe you can tell because when they have a test coming in a, in a class that's difficult for them, they're very stressed and short with you. So you can tell by that that they have a fear of getting bad grades. Maybe they're afraid of their friends, what their friends think of them, and that you know how that's going to come out. What is so-and-so going to say if I can't go there, or I need this kind of shirt because of that person? Mom, I would die if, right? Those are things your kids are afraid of. Another question you want to answer to, do you believe in Jesus Christ? You might think of a covenant home that's something you could take for granted, but I hope you don't. And it doesn't mean that you want to doubt them all the time, but you want to help your teenager move from fearing you to fearing God. And part of that is talking to them about who Christ is and, and what they believe about him, and not just because you said it. What are idols? That's another question. What are some of their idols? So that's another question. If you ask your teenager, they're probably not going to have a very good answer for you. But what is something that they sacrifice for? Maybe they sacrifice a meal because they want to go out with a friend. Or maybe they sacrifice time with friends for a grade. So when you see sacrifices like that, that should be a hint that there's a possible possibility that that could be an idol in their life. One other question or one other thought for idols is, what are they willing to get in trouble for? So if you set a curfew for your child and they're consistently late because I was at so-and-so's house and I don't want to leave until everybody else leaves, that's an idol. They're willing to get in trouble with you for the perception of the other people there. So those are some hard things. And, and again, don't ask them straight out, but you, there are questions that you want to have going in your mind to figure out how, how the child would answer that. And maybe you have to help them. It seems like you're afraid of this. How could that be? Or could I be right about that? So um, we want to talk to them also then about how God has worked by his grace in our lives in some of those things because you and I have things we fear. You and I have things that are idols in our lives, and so we don't want to make it seem like we're the only people with these problems. So that was all under the heading. We want to take time to communicate, and there was a lot we threw at you about communicating uh, with them. Uh, the other thing of what we do is that as we're talking to them about sin struggles in their lives, as we're talking to them about the suffering that goes on in their lives, and a lot of times those two things come together, they intersect in their lives, and when they're suffering, they may sin in response to that suffering. What we want to get at is not just outward behavior with them. Not just outward behavior. Not just the do's and the don'ts. This is a wonderful age of opportunity to teach them about their hearts, what's going on in here. And so we want to follow what Jesus says in Luke 6, uh, 44 and 45, where he gives this illustration of a tree. And in fact, uh, a lot of times if I'm talking to people about this, I'll have a marker board in my office, and I'm not much of an artist, but I draw a tree, I can draw a tree on a board and fruit on it, yeah. <laughs> But I'll draw fruit on it, and then let's identify bad fruit in our lives. Let's identify good fruit. And so you can use what Jesus says here with your teenagers that way. Every tree is known by his own fruit. 
Their thorns men do not gather figs, nor their bramble bush gather their grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So we want our young people to understand, even as we do, that whatever comes out of their mouths and what comes out of their lives arose from their heart. And a good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces evil fruit. Okay, is this fruit evil? They can understand what evil is outwardly. What was going on in here? And that's what we want to help them to understand. And we can use scripture to do that. Um, we had kids that would ride to school together in the morning, and one of them was always wanting to leave five minutes early because for some reason she had to be at school a half hour before it started. And the other one was always, always running late, sometimes running out the door with shoes, backpack, flying things out of the backpack or flying out and still late. <clears throat> and so you have two sinful hearts of selfishness. One of them wants everything to be on her timeline, and the other one isn't willing to hurry or get up a little bit early to make sure she gets to school on time. So 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15. He that died for all that, sorry, Jesus Christ died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. So that verse is telling us that someone who lives for Christ is a person who serves others. How can you serve your sister who wants to get to school on time? And then to the other child, how can you serve your sister who's always running a little bit late? So if you have a selfishness, I think that's a great text to use, for example. Um, arguing, not just with you, but sometimes teenagers argue with each other or their siblings. Philippians 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So that, first of all, it goes back to addressing selfishness, right? But that first part, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, and be humble. So instead of arguing with your younger sibling, you can be humble and you can teach them, or you can just let it go, but there's no reason that things have to be done through arguing, and, and vain glory is basically the word selfishness there. So there's a lot of scripture on selfishness, and as adults who have um, sinful hearts, you know that too. And it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, one other scripture that comes to mind for teenagers, um, Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but is delighted in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. So I, I would use this with a child who maybe is listening to ungodly music or watching a, a terrible show on TV that does not depict godly activities. And you could say to them, is the music that you're listening to, when you listen to that, are you walking in the counsel of the ungodly? Or are you standing in the way of sinners? There's a lot of ways to apply that part. And then positively, how are you delighting in the word of God as you do that? So those are just a couple of ways that we can use scripture and get at the root of a, a behavior that is outwardly unpleasing to us, but why? We can't just say, don't listen to that music, but let's talk about that. And those are wonderful opportunities then for us as parents as well to talk about the gospel. And I know, I, I mentioned earlier a quote from a book, and uh, it reminded me, you know, do my children see the gospel in me? So in the way I treat them, but now also, do I talk about the gospel, the good news of salvation, to my children? I think it's a great question for us. Are we bringing the gospel to them? Are we leaving that for Sunday? It's good that they hear the gospel on Sunday, but are they hearing the gospel from us as parents uh, in our homes, in their suffering and in their sin? So we want to speak to them the gospel and about the cross of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins that's found in Christ. They're struggling with sin. And they're sorry for their sin. They're broken by their sin. And we want to bring to them that gospel. We want them to confess their sins and know that there's forgiveness for their sins in the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's part of what we want to teach them. But also, these are moments to pray with them. 
When's the last time you prayed one-on-one -on -one with your teenage son or daughter? That's a question for me, too. I have before. I'm thankful for those opportunities, those wonderful moments. To pray about um, our need for the cross, to pray about our need for sanctification, to confess sin before God, and to cry out, oh God, help us. We need help. And in that way, we model the gospel, and we model what confession of sin looks like. We model uh, what forgiveness is all about as well. So take opportunities to pray with your kids and take opportunities to pray for them. Pray for them daily. Husbands and wives, before you go to bed at night, pray for your kids. Pray for the work of the Holy Spirit in them. Pray that they would know uh, this glorious gospel as well. And pray for them very specifically uh, as well. So that's what we do. Some of the things that we do, at least as parents. Now a few things that we can address with them. We, uh, we looked at this again, and what things do we talk about here? We're just going to mention a few things tonight. One struggle that is common in the teenagers is peer pressure. And the biblical phrase for that is a little different. If you look at Proverbs 29, verse 25, the fear of man brings a snare. But whosoever putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So fear of man, that phrase right there is the biblical way to say peer pressure. The heart issue there is I'm more afraid of what my friends think of me than what God thinks of me. And when you say it that way, you kind of cringe, right? And as parents, I, I can't say that we're exempt from the fear of man either. So I'm pretty sure that all of you understand that as well. It's something we need to address with our teenagers, what they don't fear others, but they're able to love and serve them. God calls us to love him first of all, but then love our neighbor. And so that's in the summary of the law, and we want our kids to do that too, instead of being afraid of them. This is something that, as we feel that peer pressure as parents or the fear of man, we want to model that to our kids, but also don't forget to just tell them, I know that struggle, I've been there, and I'm still there. Sometimes it's hard to not be afraid of what other people think of you. I get it. But then you can encourage them, too, and that's a good time to pray together. So one of the struggles is peer pressure, fear of man. Uh, the other struggle uh, that I think uh, we need to be encouraged to address is the suffering that our young people have in their lives. More and more we have it that um, parents are coming to us, uh, or we hear about it from others as well. You know, our young person is struggling with anxiety. Um, they're struggling because they've been hurt in relationships and hurt by classmates. And what do we do? And, and often they're talking about, well, who can we send them to to get help? And what we often do is say, well, you're the parents. God has called you to this work. Now we want to encourage you. Here are some ideas. But you're on the front lines. You're there on an everyday basis. And God's put you there. So just an encouragement to you as parents as well to um, when, when your young people are struggling with some of these things, anxiety, they've been hurt by fellow classmates, um, they may have too much going on in their lives. Um, in a lot of ways, our young people are having to grow up quickly, and so they're balancing a lot of different things. They've got schoolwork and responsibilities there, and they're maybe thinking about college. Um, they've got sporting events. Maybe they're trying to hold down a job and be able to put gas in their car, and then their car breaks down. And I mean, things build up pretty quickly, and we as adults kind of forget, well, this is what we're dealing with every day. We're adults, but they're not quite there yet. They're dealing with a lot of stresses and pressures, and we need to teach them so that when they're older, they can handle it in a way that is God-glorifying in their lives uh, as well. So dealing with these things Calmly, patiently, I have my notes, don't freak out. Uh, we, sometimes we can do that as parents. Don't freak out. Be with them calmly and patiently and humbly. Be ready to bring God's word to them. Pray with them. Sometimes you say, I'm not sure how to help you right now, but I'm going to think about it, and we're going to work through this together. Um, so help them in, in any way that you can in the suffering. The last thing, Jen didn't want to touch this one, we're trying to get bold. 
is dating and sex. So um, just an encouragement to you as parents, talk to your young people as they go through these things. It's just interesting for me to know when I do premarriage counseling, I do a section on sex. I want them to have a good theology of sex, a good biblical understanding of it. But I always, I almost always ask couples when I do premarriage counseling, how much do your parents talk to you about sex? I've not kept a tally. It's very little. And I say to them, I'm talking to you about it. I want to do it from a right biblical perspective. I don't go in areas where I shouldn't go, but I encourage them to don't make the same mistake. So parents, if you're not talking to your young people about it, where are they going to hear it from? They're going to get it from somewhere. It ought to be from you. So talk to your young people about dating, about sex, about purity. Um, tell them no, 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 not until the day you are married. Talk to them about it. Um, along with that, you I hope you've heard about the dangers of pornography for boys and girls today. I don't know if there's a greater, greater danger for our young people today than pornography. Because it's right here. It's accessible unless there are filters and blocks in you need to talk to your young people about it, but you also need to set guards for them. There's all kinds of help for those things, um, but you need to have filtering software on the devices of your children, and you need to check up those devices regularly. They need to have, you need to have their passwords to their phones and their passwords to their accounts. They do not have the right to privacy. They don't. And so just an encouragement to all of us uh, to talk about these things, communicate about them, tell them, tell your young people, I do this for your good, it's because I love you that I do this, it's not because we like to do it, but because, remember where we started, we are young people, and the children of God, struggling with sin, and suffering as well, so we need to have very frank conversations about these things, so an encouragement to all of us to move forward, to talk about these things. I get the last word. Hopefully tonight you've been able to get some help and encouragement from us. You're probably thinking this is going to take a lot of work. Even preparing for this, which reminded me of some of the places that we've been slacking. And the word always exposes our selfishness and desire to do things the easy way instead of do them fully God's way. And we can all inspire and encourage each other on that, right? Also, don't pin your hopes on having perfect teenagers. They're going to disappoint you. They'll suffer sometimes, and they'll take it out on you. There's times for warning in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Times for warning, times for comforting and comporting. And may God give us the ability to discern those times. But parent faithfully and prayerfully before the face of God so that you can say, thank you, Lord, for using this teenager to change me. And also, Lord, help us all to enjoy the blessings of raising teenagers. All right. Any questions? <coughs> we covered a lot tonight. We were given the opportunity to ask questions. We were thinking about it so much as we went through, but we can do that informally. Uh, if you don't have a question, I have one. But anyway, do you have any questions? Yeah, Patty. I was thinking that we might want to wait until your child probably changes a little bit to not worry about giving them the children on the spot. You look back and you know you're 13 and you're at the age of the difference from that first child from your older children to your younger children that you would say, yeah, this is changing how we done this. Yeah, the old one said to you, oh, you're so lenient now, and the youngest one, she never got spanked, and uh, those types of things. But we, what we tell them is, 
you guys set a good example for them. We had to do, to tell you the truth, we had to do far less parenting with our younger kids because our older kids were setting a good example for them. Um, and so we tell them that. They're, they're still not buying it, but <laughs> it is true. It's very true. Um, great question. Yeah. I think we parented with more grace. Now. Now than before. I think that's something that's changed and that we've grown in. Um, just the ability to say, okay, when you're smarting off to me like that, what else is really going on here? If it wasn't right for you to do that, and you won't let them get by with it, but t the ability to understand there's something behind that maybe, that's important. And so to, to not just, at least for myself, to just bring the hammer down and say, you will not talk to your mother that way. You're not supposed to, and I, and I do express that, but maybe more gently, and then also ask what's going on behind that. So I think... I think we've parented with more grace with our older ones. I think I was always looking for the rebellion, like, oh, that's it, and just ready to clamp down on them. And I think as, as the younger ones are smaller, I've been more gracious about that instead of just looking for that. Like that rebellion at the beginning that we look for, that's what you find. And I think that was true even back then. Right. Yeah, I would agree with the same, same thing. Uh, um, our son came home recently, and uh, he was working, and there was a guy who came to work. He works at an oil change place. And the guy came through. He had all kinds of piercings and tattoos. Well, he, uh, the guy who runs the place is a guy in the church. And so he said to Garrett, um, hey, what would your dad say if he came home with all those piercings and tattoos? You know? and, and so I think he was kind of testing him a little bit. And he said, no, I, I don't know. And then he said, I've never seen, seen my dad you know, really, really mad. So, I don't think our oldest child would say that. Our oldest child wouldn't say that, and then I think our son just doesn't mean that. So, which I can be thankful for, that his memory is, is bad. Um, but I, what Jen said is correct. I think we've learned, I, I, especially in the past five or ten years, to parent with much more grace, to be calm, to be patient. It's amazing how often the Bible tells us to be patient with one another, and to be patient with our parenting as well. Um, I, I think partly what you're going to do is you're going to go back to Christ. So one of the ways is to go back to Jesus. Who suffered more at the hands of people than Jesus did? So, I mean, I can remember, my dad's not here, so I can say this, right? So, um, well, that's okay. When I was younger, uh, you know, maybe seventh, eighth grade, there was a bully in class in school, and yeah, oh, she, <laughs> Jan talking. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But anyway, you know, my dad said, well, just, you know, let them have it back. Well, I did one time, and uh, anyway, that didn't go well. <laughs> but now I look back, and I just say, well, that's not biblical. Um, or, so what is God, how, how does God call us to respond to people, whether it's real um, or not? How does God call that's our starting point on it and we want to teach them that the right response is always one of love even though it might not feel good and it feels like people are taking advantage of now that doesn't get all the specifics or to be specific in how that gets worked out but if you go back to Christ and you go to first Peter um, 2 Peter 3 right yeah and the way Jesus responded when we reviled you very viled not again and, and all the rest he didn't say anything in return love your enemies says, go love them. So that doesn't mean you're, you're a doormat. You can tell them, stop. Please don't do this. Uh, I'm going to tell so-and-so. But, uh, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So, 
So great question. So yeah, th those things can happen. Um, and so maybe there's something that's going on between you two students, or maybe not even students, but two kids, two young people. Um, how does that dealt with? And I think partly you want to teach them and tell them, you know, this is how to go to your friend or this classmate and talk to them. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then I think there's Go, you go talk to the parent. But I, I think a, a good starting point normally, depending on age and so on, is how are they going to try to work that out if they're able to, if it's something too big for that. And you make that judgment, then you have to work that out with the parents. But even then, to be very careful in, in how you do that, to do that kindly, to do that compassionately, um, and, uh, and try to work that out. But yeah, you know, the whole helicopter mom, they call it type of thing that, that you know, that is a danger. And yeah, I care some say mama bear comes out and, and we have to be careful with that and um, help them in the right way. Other questions? So I can end with my question. Um, so sometimes we've gone to parenting conference or read things and then we come away from it thinking, oh man, we've, we've really bungled things, we've made a mess of this, what do we do now? Um, we, don't, we don't want you to come away from this and say, oh no, what do we do now? I don't, I don't know how things are going in your parenting and maybe they're going well, um, but maybe for other us, others of us were thinking, we need to hit the reset button. Where's the reset button on this? Um, the reset button is there. Um, it's a biblical way. Um, we learned this from another counselor who had a great idea with a family that was struggling with some things, and the way he said it is have a family meeting. So if you're wondering what to do, maybe you think we're not doing what we should be doing. We've had to do this. And we've done that at times. We've talked to the kids and said, we've not been faithful. We're sorry. We've not been doing what we're called to do. So we have this time together, maybe after, after family worship, we confess our sin to them. We've not been faithful in calling your attention to things and setting a high enough standard for you. So we've done wrong in that. We're going to make some changes. And we explain that clearly to them. This counselor encouraged giving a week of grace. So we're going to remind you of that consistently through the week. But after that, then there are going to be consequences you're not living as God wants you to live. Um, so uh, explain clearly the changes, confess your love for them, pray about it, but then <coughs> you can do a reset. And you can change some things if you're not, if you see you're not doing some things as you ought to do. So um, I encourage you to do that if you need to. One of the most important things for us to do as parents is confess our sins to our kids. All right, uh, if I close in prayer again, or do you have other, other things? Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the good gifts that God has given to us. There are so many of them. The chief of them is Jesus Christ and our salvation in him. But thou art a God who is also pleased to work in the line of generations. That's part of thy covenant covenant promise of you are God to us. But also with that promise comes a calling that we've been given to teach and instruct your coming generations in thy ways. It's not an easy calling. We found that out. So Father, give us strength. Give us strength in our parenting to reflect Jesus Christ and the gospel of thee our God. Give, give us strength that we reflect thy grace and thy mercy so that our children would see thy grace and mercy reflected in us. Father, where we need a reset, give us the strength to carry that out and to confess our sins and to know that thou art a God who forgives and will give strength. And be with our teenagers, their struggles they face, sin struggles, sufferings that they go through. It's a hard time of life, but thou art a God who's given us to help them, to encourage them, to strengthen them, 
as they prepare to live as adults in this sinful world. So strengthen us for this calling, strengthen them that they may grow in godliness and truth, that they may love Jesus more and more and follow him in all that they do. We thank you for this time together to encourage each other. We ask that thou wilt forgive us where we have sinned and strengthen us ever to be faithful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you do have any uh, follow-up questions for a speech tonight, I'll give you Jen's email address. <laughs> um, no, if you do have any questions, uh, you can find my, you should be able to find my email address easy enough. If nothing else, it's in the back of the access center. Feel free to email questions.